check. One, two. <coughs> check. Check. One, two. Check. 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 One, two, check. Check, check. One, two. Check. One, two, check. 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 One, two, check. Check. One, two, check. 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 One, two, check. Check. One, two, check. Check. Check, check, one, two. Sorry, guys, I'm just mic checking this so I can hear it better. <coughs> All right, let's. morning everybody hello good to see you how's the sound it does my is my voice coming through clearly Um, Christine, I doubt that it'll be a full two hours today. I'll probably go on for about an hour and a half or something like that. Maybe an hour and 20 minutes or something. Um, mostly today we're just going to be looking at reviewing the Renaissance a bit. I've got some things that you can use to, to review and like a little assignment to go along with, with the lesson. Um... Let's 
just go over here and get this set up. Oops. Oh, it was fine. Um, the doctor's appointment was just a, an ultrasound on my thyroid that's just painless and it went by really fast. Um, let's see. So that's good. I think that this should be the next one. This works. If it doesn't, We got like 19 people in here, so we'll see. We'll see where things go from there. Give people a few minutes to join still. Oh, wow. That's nice. Okay. We can close that. <coughs> oh wait. Yes. And I think whoops. Cancel. Is Wait. Uh. Okay. Now I gotta copy that folder over to the other classes. Should be good to go. Well, folks, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Hopefully, um, hopefully, this will be helpful to you guys. Remember that I am on about a 30 second delay here. Hey, Yoey Joe, good to see you. Uh, Benjamin, good morning. Renee, good morning. Jackie Peng, good morning. Hello to all of you, Colin, Alex, Samuel. It's good to see you all in here. Um, 
So today we're going to do a little bit of lecture or I just just review really on the Renaissance. I decided that today we would start doing a little bit of review of previous units that gives us a little bit, um, you know, of, uh, of an edge in terms of being prepared for anything that's thrown at us on the on the AP Euro exam. So hopefully, um, hopefully when you guys take the test in a little bit, uh, in about a month here, you'll feel like, hey, I, I'm, I'm ready to take this and I I'm, 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 can answer anything that they throw at me. Remember, it is a DBQ as well. So it's not just about rote memorization of facts, but uh, more about placing the DBQ into the context of what you know. Because, um, you know, the thing about these DBQs is that if you're not using the... Um, if you're not using the documents to answer your your argument or to uh, substantiate your argument, then um, and you're only doing it off of what you know, then you could potentially end up with a with a pretty rough essay. So um, I want to do a couple of things here. First of all, um, thank you for joining up. Secondly, um, I will say that I've added a new lesson folder onto. Schoology for what we're going to be doing today. Um, I'm going to also, while I'm at it here, um, download something that maybe you've been using already. I don't know if you've used these or not, but I'm going to show you um, some some things that you can use to to review that are already available to you on Schoology. And uh, just take a few minutes to to talk about the Renaissance and, and review some of the big ideas that we talked about there. So let me go ahead and switch over here to my desktop so that you guys can see what's going on. Let me um, make this smaller first. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna switch it over to that tab. And then, hmm. Okay, let's do this. I'm gonna close this. Just trying to clean up my desktop a little bit because I've got kind of stuff everywhere open right now. So I'm trying to like make it more presentable and organized so that you guys can follow with what's going on. Okay, I think that should be good. Now, uh, first thing I wanna show you guys here is you can ignore, I'm gonna move this off to the side. You're gonna be able to see, um, I have Schoology pulled up here. And let me pull this over here a little bit. Okay, so I got Schoology pulled up here and I wanna just take a minute to show you some of the things that you do have available to you. Um, in this green folder here that says review materials, now I know I'm on period zero, but it doesn't matter which period you're in because all the folders should be identical to one another. Um, you're going to click on this review materials folder and at the top here there's another purple folder that says chapter review guides and you can click on that and included in here i have a number i did not make these i i, I stole these from another teacher well she gave them to me but um anyway i i thought that she did such a fantastic job i asked her for all of her review sheets that she created which are these little pdfs and this takes and really boils down and reduces the big concepts of these units. And th some of them are combined. So this one's both Renaissance and Reformation. So this is actually both unit one and two. But I wanted to take a minute to show you these. Um, it'll pop up with a preview here. You are also able to download it if you so choose. And you can open this up and you'll be able to see um, some big ideas uh, of the Renaissance and, and Reformation further down here. And it's not to say that this is an end-all list, okay? Certainly there's other things that you could study uh, pertaining to the Renaissance and the Reformation. This it doesn't have absolutely every fact ever known to man about the thing, obviously. It's a pretty condensed deal. But I would say that if you read through this and you have a pretty good idea of some of the things that it's talking about, um, you can use this if you get to a particular part and you say, oh gosh, Northern Renaissance, you know, I don't remember what that was compared to the regular Italian Renaissance. I forget the difference between those two things. 
then then use that as an opportunity. The really the the way to use these is as you're reading it to be asking yourself questions. Do I understand what I'm? You have to kind of use some metacognition. Think about your thinking. Uh, don't just read it and say, oh, okay, that happened. You have to ask, do I really understand what's going on here? Emergence of a wealthy merchant class. What, is, what does that mean in Italian Renaissance? Well, we get the Medicis, for example, right? We have these wealthy banking merchant class families that um, are increasingly living a kind of more urban lifestyle and trading along the Mediterranean and so on. Okay, but we see new industries like bookkeeping open up, new markets for goods. Uh, remember that Italy was like the center of Mediterranean trade at this time. They have monopolies on trade goods like wool. And um, so Italy is really the center for the revival of trade after the, uh, after the Middle Ages, right? The late Middle Ages, which was the time of, like we talked about in class with William Manchester's book, A World Lit Only by Fire. Um, that book described just how dark the Middle Ages really were and how, um, uh, you know, the kind of like historical differences that people um, of that time, the 1400s and earlier had compared to nowadays, which is, you know, people were very, very, it was just a totally different society back then. Okay. It, uh, Italy definitely economically fueled the Renaissance. All right. It definitely fueled the Renaissance. The Renaissance was a revival or a rebirth of all of these different ancient Greco-Roman art, architecture, literature, things like that. And Renaissance society at this time is a very feudal society. So remember that Europe in the early days of Europe, it was super, super feudal. Um, feudalism was the main social system of the day. And what is feudalism? But feudalism is that you know, if you think about nobles, right? Nobles owning the land and um, peasants living on the land, right? Tenant farming would be another way of describing it, where basically you have huge, huge plots of land that are um, subdivided amongst nobles. And, um, and then you have peasants who are living on common grounds of those lands and tending those farms and stuff. It's subsistence f style farming for the most part across Europe. They're doing just enough farming to get themselves by. It's not like plantation style farming where they're working endlessly all day, every day, every day of the week, uh, every week of the month, every month of the year. What is going on back here? Harrison, you're freaking out. Chill out, Harrison. Now, um, so that's that's feudalism and there's there's a whole social system at this time remember that italy and all of europe in the 1400s there's a there's a very rigid social order and and that extends even into the heavens where we have god at the top and then maybe you know jesus and then mary and the saints and then angels and then Remember that there's it's a the way that they structure society back in those times isn't just as simple as first, second, and third estate. Every everything in the world that these people had ever conceived of had a known orderly place in the creation of being, where um, to to leave that place and either elevate yourself to another level or um, or reduce yourself to another level. Um, was difficult. Um, there, there's not much social mobility at this time. If you're born a peasant, your kids are going to be peasants, your kids' kids are going to be peasants, just like your father and your grandfather and your great-grandfather were all peasants as well. It's just how the social system works at this time. Now, down the line, we do see some changes to that, particularly in France, where we start to see things like noble of the robe titles being sold and stuff. But generally speaking, in the 1400s and 1500s, very rigid social order of being and and that extended into every realm of life that could include secular titles like king or um, you know duke or baron or earl or whatever else like the noble titles going all the way down the scale down to more like gentry level people like knights and other people like that and then you get further down yet and you get into like your yeoman farmers who are independent but not of any social standing and own a piece of land themselves but it's usually a small piece of land and they just kind of tend that farm on their own 
and then all the way down to like peasants and then below peasants of course you have slaves which in Europe at this time slaves are not widespread they do exist um, but they're not it's not we're not to the age of exploration yet and so we haven't seen the rise of the Atlantic slave trade in the 1400s because the Atlantic slave trade doesn't exist yet until 1490 after 1492 when Columbus sails across the ocean so um, to talk a little bit more about Renaissance society okay let me uh, zoom in a little bit here so you can see this perhaps a bit better first second and third estates just to remind you first estate is clergy second estate is going to be nobility third estate is everybody else and especially in the early days uh, the vast majority of the population falls into the third estate the the first and second estate um, are are very very small although in Italy um, you do see a widening um, um, particular segment of the third estate called uh, the bourgeois class right the middle class you kind of have these wealthier merchants okay the nobles themselves were expected to be pretty well educated uh, remember that phrase renaissance man castiglione the book of the courtier okay training somebody on how to be a proper noble and we talked about that in class um, castiglione's book of the courtier or the courtier which talks about uh, how the ideal noble is a renaissance man somebody who both knows how to fight uh, or at least won't back down from a fight but at the same time is a man who is um, able to be learned, who is a poet, who is well-read, who is devoutly Christian, meaning Catholic at that time, um, and so on and so forth. Okay, so they were expected to be um, jacks of all trades, in a sense, all right? Good at a lot of different things. Now, women at this time, of course, don't have any political or economic rights. They have a lower status of, in men, both in public and in private spheres, meaning both in like a public city uh, walking around, uh, but also within the household. Um, they were more or less expected to bear children and manage the house. Sometimes you do see, though, um, what we call like family economy uh, during this time, where women did play vital roles in supporting men in doing things like bookkeeping or assisting in shops or even doing some of the labor themselves. Uh, for the family style economy where you had these small trades that were family owned and the woman might be the person who is kind of up front dealing with the customers the wife that is and then the husband may be back working on cobbling shoes or something like that um, now the, it's different from the Middle Ages when women um, could work in shops or even serve as guild masters we do see in many places this is the thing that's tricky about this what I just described to you, that family economy, takes place in a lot of places in Europe. But the reason that we're mentioning it is because we're starting to see that change in Italy. Okay, so women's roles are changing. Uh, where in the Middle Ages, women could work in shops, even serve as guild masters at times. Now we're seeing the roles of women change a bit. Uh, marriages at this time are often arranged. Business deals uh, were used to... Uh, bring families together, increase the status or wealth of a family by marrying into a slightly wealthier one. Um, dowries were a very common thing at this time as well, where the male family had to provide, uh, excuse me, the female uh, family, the wife's family had to provide a gift to the husband's family to go along with the bride um, so as to kind of like uh, send their daughter away with a certain amount of kind of a startup uh, contribution to the marriage and then thereafter it would have been the expectation of the husband to take care of his wife and of course this factors into our story in the Renaissance because uh, this very thing dowries uh, and the role of women comes into play when we talk about Catherine of Aragon who was sent from Spain to England to marry the first son the eldest son of the new English Tudor dynasty king uh, Henry the seventh and Henry the seventh had a son named Arthur who from the time that Arthur was an infant uh, was betrothed to a baby girl infant um, to be married when they are of appropriate age and um, so when she is 14 or 15 years old roughly she is sent up from Spain to England to settle and live her life as the um, English princess at first because Henry the seventh is still alive at that point 
and marry his son Arthur. And then when Arthur became king, uh, then she would become Queen of England. Well, it doesn't quite work out that way. If you remember the story, Arthur ends up, first of all, not being that interested in women. And then secondly, um, he ends up dying of tuberculosis. And so she's kind of left kept around. But the main reason that she was sent to England is because England had reached out to Spain to try to secure a Catholic ally. Remember, at this time, England is Catholic uh, under Henry VII. And, um, and they reached out to Spain to find a common ally against the French, who were traditionally going to war against the British with the Hundred Years' War at that time. And, um, and the dowry that was sent along with Elizabeth uh, was substantial to Henry VII. And um, he was very, very much more excited about that dowry arriving of a bunch of Spanish jewels with, uh, with the Princess Catherine of Aragon than he was about the princess herself. So uh, this is, this is uh, how that factors into that story as well. So anyhow, um, Renaissance politics, let's talk a little bit about that. There are basically two forms of government. By the way, in case you didn't realize what they're doing here, that's kind of like Persia category. So politics, economics, religion, society, etc. Not all of it, but uh, two forms of governance. You had kind of national monarchies or city-states at this time. So Italy is made up. It's, remember that Italy and, and uh, the Holy Roman Empire remain divided at this time. But one of the main political changes that we're seeing during the Renaissance is we're starting to see the development of national monarchies. And what I mean by that is sometimes they call them new monarchs. So previously, in a more feudal middle-aged Europe, um, uh, Middle Ages Europe or, or Dark Ages Europe, um, um, power held by the king was far from centralized because um, transport is difficult, communication is difficult in Europe at this time, and um, a lot of power rests with local, um, here I'll turn this over here, a lot of power rests with local um, local lords. So kind of like if you think about the story of Robin Hood, and how the sheriff of Nottingham's had so much local authority. The king doesn't, doesn't really have a whole lot of mm, individual localized power at this time because the farther you are away from the king, um, and if you think about it, like France, you, you, you may not think of France as being a large country by modern day standards, but remember that the world was a much smaller place back in the old, or excuse me, a much larger place back in the olden days. Today, it's a much smaller place. You can get places pretty easily today using cars and modern transportation, planes and so on. But back in those days, they didn't have any of that. And traveling across land was really difficult. And it took a long, long time. And it was also super dangerous. It was easy to get lost. It was dark. You had highwaymen out there who would rob you. It's, a, it's, it's, not, a, it's not an ideal climate. And so the farther you are away from, from the king, the more local regional power that you're going to have as a, as, a, as a noble. You don't even have to be the king. Locally, pretty much all the affairs would, would settle on whoever ran things locally. But we start to see that change in the Renaissance, and that's the kind of the trend that I'm trying to talk about right now is these new monarchs. These new monarchs are doing what they can to try to consolidate their power, to try to reduce their beginning to. They're not all the way there yet. We're going to get there when we get to the age of absolutism in the later 1500s, early 1600s. But, but in the Renaissance is when we start to see kind of um, national monarchies develop, where you have a king of England who is, who is really doing a cons making a concerted effort to try to consolidate his power. And, um, and we also see new monarchs quite literally in the form of, of new dynasties. So in England, we've got a brand new dynasty after the War of the Roses in England, which was basically uh, a, a kind of a dynastical war between um, a disputing who should rule England. And that the War of the Roses was between the Lancaster, uh, the Lancastrian um, branch of the, of the Plantagenet dynasty and the Yorkist branch of the Plantagenet dynasty. And so these two factions were fighting against one another for who should be the proper uh, ruler of England at that time. Lo and behold, there's a war at the Battle of Bosworth Field, or a uh, battle at the uh, Battle of Bosworth Field, where um, Henry Tudor is victorious in this battle and uh, slays 
the existing king whose name was Richard the Third. He was the guy that had scoliosis, and uh, they found his body under a parking lot about five or ten years ago. Anyhow, um, so uh, you might remember some of these stories. I'm, per I'm deliberately trying to jog your memory a little bit in terms of some of the things that we talked about during the Renaissance. So Henry Tudor, that's one of the new monarchs. Another new monarch that you could look at would be, um, let's see here, uh, the, the king and queen of Spain. So Spain previously uh, had been a kind of a fragmented monarchy. They had the, the um, uh, what's called the uh, Kingdom of Castile and the Kingdom of Aragon. So Ferdinand of Aragon, Catherine of Castile, um, excuse me, not Catherine, um, Isabella of Castile, Catherine's her daughter, and Isabella of Castile and uh, Ferdinand of Aragon, and they married, and, and, and at that point is when their uh, two kingdoms became joined together. So that would be a new monarch. Um, in Russia, although, although I, I scarce, scarce I, shouldn't I shouldn't really, really bring, bring Russia into this conversation, conversation but, but down, you're going to see down, down the line here, here the, the Romanov, Romanov dynasty starts, starts in Russia. Russia. Um, and, and then, then you've, you've got, got the Habsburgs, Habsburgs right, right, in, um, in Austria. Austria. And, um, and so, so that's, that's another uh, significant, significant monarchy at this time. time. And, and then, then you, you have, have the, the, the Bourbon, Bourbon dynasty in France, in France which, which um, well, it's, it's not, not the, the Bourbon, Bourbon dynasty yet. yet. It's, it's the Beloy dynasty in France, France but, but it's, it's going, going to be the Bourbon dynasty in about a century here when we get to Henry IV, Henry the Good King. So he's the first of the Bourbon dynasty. But um, we've got the Valois dynasty in France right now. Sometimes uh, the wars between France and Austria at this time are called, um, sorry if it's echoing, I can maybe move this away a little bit. Um, the war, uh, the habsburg Valois wars, um, or the Franco-Italian, or the um, Franco-Austrian Franco Franco -Austrian wars, but mostly they're called the habsburg Valois wars because the Habsburgs, and the Beloit dynasty in France didn't get along very well with one another at that time. Um, is the echo okay? I don't hear an echo on my side, so if there's, hopefully it's not too echoey. But, um, the whole idea about this is that increasingly during this time when we see centralization of, of these monarchs' authority, they are trying to um, they're trying to uh, get a get a hold of or get um, they're trying to consolidate all of the rule across their land um, in a single person. So this is the path towards absolutism. Um, it's not absolutist yet. There's still a lot of regional authority. That's why I'm skeptical to mention Russia as a new monarchy because it's really technically not yet. Russia's still far backwards. And remember that um, even, even into the 17 and 1800s, local, um, local um, boyars or, or Russian nobles tended to have a lot of authority. The farther away you are from, say, St. Petersburg or Moscow, um, the further you go into history, the, the more difficult it's going to be for the Tsar to, to really micromanage what's going on that far away because Russia remains so far. It's huge, and then it remains so far under-industrialized even after 1800. So um, I, I shouldn't mention Russia as a new monarch, to be honest with you. France, Spain, England, but definitely not Italy because Italy is run on city-states at this time. And then um, the Holy Roman Empire is a bunch of like a thousand different principalities and bishoprics and other things like that. They're tiny, tiny, tiny little places at times um, on this map. And it's not until after the um, after this era where we get to the Thirty Years War that we start to see the Holy Roman Empire start to consolidate a little bit. But it still remains even after the uh, even after the Thirty Years War. It still remains like. 300 and some different um, principalities and things like that. So, so the Holy Roman Empire in Italy remained very, um, very fragmented, very city-state um, oriented, and um, not at all unified. Remember that Italy and Germany don't unify until right before we left from the COVID virus, basically. So it takes, uh, it takes a long time for them to get on board with centralizing and, and unifying their, uh, their states. Okay, mm -mm 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 -mm. let's move back over here to this thing again. All right, moving down. Um, 
the Peace of Lodi, uh, 1454 balance of power amongst the five Italian city-states, the big ones being Florence, Naples, Milan, Venice, and the Papal States. The Papal States is where the Pope is. They are rivals with one another. They can't cooperate, which means they can't unite. Even remember, there are some wars between France and Italy at this time where France takes advantage of the fact that the Italian city-states don't get along with one another and they are very competitive with one another and they keep them fragmented by warring with different parts of, um, of Italy and allying with other parts of, it, of Italy. Uh, so disunity made them very susceptible to attack, both from, from Spain and from France. So the Italian city-states, for all of their advantages with trade and merchant-type uh, merchant jobs and stuff like that, um, they remain kind of politically pretty weak. And that's, by the way, where we get Machiavelli, right? And Machiavelli, his whole thing on the prince was a uh, critique of, of, you know, Italian politics at the time. And, and Machiavelli was frustrated that Italian uh, rulers of these city-states seemingly couldn't, um, couldn't find a way to get over their petty grievances with one another and, and also made some pretty blunderous mistakes politically that kept them weaker than they needed to be. And so Machiavelli's whole argument was like, if you want a really good leader to run Italy, you have to guy, find a guy who's kind of two-faced. You have to find a guy who's a good politician, who's going to be willing to kind of, you know, uh, you know hit people where it hurts, but at the same time, uh, turn around and kind of be benevolent at times as well. A guy who's, who's more feared than he is loved. And so this, is, this, this Machiavellian approach to politics is what was what... Machiavelli thought would be the prescription towards eventually unifying uh, Italy. And um, it's not to say that he's wrong, but it just takes a really long time for that to happen uh, because Italy will go several centuries uh, continuing to be fragmented and, and finding themselves uh, weaker and weaker and weaker politically as well as militarily to, compared to, say, a place that's centralizing like France. Okay, uh, moving on. You've got uh, the art of the Renaissance is obviously a huge part of the Renaissance art, a rebirth of the ancient Greco-Roman classics. Okay, um, patronage is a big part of this. What is patronage? It's when wealthy people, particularly this brand new wealthy merchant class, uses their money to finance artistic endeavors. Okay. Um, so if you look at like say the uh, Medici family, they're, they're super, super wealthy banking family in Florence and the Medici start using their wealth to pay for or commission as they call it, artists to make original works based on the works of the classics which had been traded back to Italy from the Byzantine Empire or the, the Ottoman Empire by this point. Um, because all of those ancient Greco-Roman pieces were actually over in, um, in Turkey, modern day, where modern day Turkey is. And they started trading, the Ottomans started trading some of these cultural um, things back to the Italians. Uh, sculptures and paintings and literary works and other things like that because the Ottomans were actually a pretty developed situ uh, civilization and kind of valued the arts and they were actually more tolerant in many cases religiously not that they were tolerant of jewish folks um, and not that they necessarily were super super good to christians during the middle ages but by the time that we get to the 14 and 1500s religious toleration is is for that time pretty good in um in the middle east compared to what we would think of today where we generally think of the middle east as being pretty religiously intolerant um, these days in, in terms of like uh, there's a lot of like theocratic type governments and like state mandated faith and things like that. Um, that was the norm back in those days, right? So, you know, it's not like freedom of religion or something like that existed anywhere in Europe. Religion dictates the entire lives of people at this time, but of places of and, and that means that toleration is quite low. Um, so the places that you go in Europe, they're not very religiously tolerant at all at this time. If you're not Catholic, you may as well be living on the moon because you just didn't fit in with society. So this is why Jews and others were treated so poorly. Muslims in particular in Spain, in southern Spain, were treated horribly 
um, by, the, by the Spanish at the time, which is another major thing that happens during the Renaissance, right? It's the Reconquista, and they kick out all of the... Um, they kick out all the Jews and, and Muslims, or, or just instead of exiling them, sometimes they just kill them. Uh, and so, and, and this is because for a period of time, southern Spain was, was controlled by the Moors, M-O-O-R-S, the Moorish people, and they were, they were Muslim, and Spain wanted to consolidate those territories under Ferdinand and Isabella, and they kicked everybody out of them in several... Uh, purges, I guess you would call it, of, of those regions. Now, to get back to the Renaissance art side of things, these works start to be traded back to uh, Italy and in Florence in particular, which is right in central Italy, um, you have these this wealthy merchant family of the Medicis who kind of runs the show there and they start using this money to patronize uh, or commission new pieces to be made. And this is where we start to see the rise of the Italian masters, guys like Leonardo da Vinci and, uh, you know, Raphael and, um, you know, uh, Michelangelo down the line a little bit later. <clears throat> and these guys end up, of course, uh, having some of the most famous Renaissance pieces in Italy. And you might remember that we did that gallery art walk where we went through and looked at a bunch of different pieces from the Italian Renaissance and so on. All right, let's move it back over to this side. Um, celebrated, what is the art all about? Three big words. Uh, if, you don't, if there's only one thing that you take away from this entire lecture, we only got 27 people in here, all right? But if there's only one thing that you take away from this entire lecture, let it be these three words. The three words that are most important for understanding how the Renaissance uh, operates as a turning point in history. Now. If we're being honest, if we're being really true historical thinkers here, we have to remember that the Renaissance really only affected people living in Italy of a particular class, okay? Meaning that it wasn't even all places in Italy at once. There's a lot of areas of Italy, particularly Southern Italy, that are super rural and agrarian. And you wonder the extent to which your average rural agrarian Italian or, or, or uh, Napoli's, okay, somebody from Napoli uh, or Naples, all right, uh, person would, would be even experiencing the Renaissance. If you're just a lowly peasant, you're not going to art museums and commissioning Michelangelo to make works for you. You're not even a viewer of those arts. Those arts are not made available to you. You're living in the middle of nowhere. And so does the Renaissance happen if you don't ever experience it? Well, it does happen. OK, but but the extent to which it's experienced by all of Europe all at once is definitely questionable. So we have to be thinking about that in the context of of European history uh, over time, which is to say that when the Renaissance happens, how many people actually know that it's happening or do they find out about it later? If the Renaissance, though, is a turning point in history, then we would have to have these three words to characterize why the Renaissance is a turning point. I wonder if in the little thing, and I'm going to give you because I'm on about a 30 second delay. I wonder if any of you can say the three words that I have on my mind as to what characterizes the Renaissance as a turning point in European history. What three words am I going to say? I'll give you a hint. All of them end in ism. Let's see if anyone can get it right. I'm very curious to see if you can get this. Elijah Kim says humanism, that is one of them. Now we need two left. Humanism is one. Sorry, it's going to be a little bit of a slow response because there's such a delay here, but 
I don't know who but Pepsi is, but yes, individualism is one as well. Nice job. And then, yes, secularism is the third one. Nice job, guys. Really, really good. Okay, nice. So humanism, individualism, secularism. Let's talk about those three terms a little bit uh, to, to make sure that you all know what those three words and how they're, how they're characterized in the Renaissance. So you might know some examples already. We've talked about these terms before. In fact, I think when we first did the Renaissance, we had even um, an SAQ that had something to do with individualism and, uh, and uh, secularism and, and um, individualism. So let's talk about these three terms. Okay, so individualism. Keep in mind that uh, during the late Middle Ages, right, you basically have a society made up of people who, who, according to William Manchester in the World Lit Only by Fire book that we read, um, have virtually no sense of ego. There's no sense of self. You have all these grandiose cathedrals uh, in Europe from the Middle Ages, and we don't know anything about the people who built them because the people who built them over the course of, in some cases, decades and decades and decades, some cases even longer than that, uh, we don't know anything about the nameless people, the countless nameless people who went into constructing these massive cathedrals in, say, Canterbury or Chartres Cathedral or something in France. And, um, and so you have this kind of unusual lack of sense of self in the medieval man's uh, architecture, right? Um, however, when we get to the Renaissance, one of the things that we see start to emerge is individual recognition for accomplishments and people, if you will, making a name for themselves. So artists start to do things like sign their work, right? Um, uh, you start to see um, notable men of what they would call men, men of letters, okay? Men of letters, poets, literary figures. Guys like Petrarch, who is often considered the father of humanism, and we'll talk about Petrarch in a little bit, but these, the very fact that you can name some of these people is itself an indication that people were thinking of themselves differently. They were thinking of themselves as individuals. And perhaps the main reason for this um, is because individual human, they're all intertwined. All three of these ter terms are really intertwined with one another. It's almost difficult to talk about them individually because all of the terms relate to one another on a certain level. So why does individualism happen? Why do people start thinking of themselves as individuals? Well, it has something to do with the fact that in the Renaissance, we do see an, a change in the emphasis of what, human, what, what humans mean to other humans. And the thing that's so interesting at this time is that you have to remember that throughout the Middle Ages, we're living in a, in a deeply, deeply, deeply religious time. And people did not live for this life. This life to them was a struggle. It was an obstacle. It was a means to exist. And then true living, okay, happened in the afterlife, where when you die, you go to heaven. There's like an eternal... Um, there's an eternal paradise, let's say, or what have you. And so people really only lived to struggle through this life and, and, and had no interest in what was an earthly possession or an earthly desire or an earthly individual identity. To them, those things weren't important. It was your contribution uh, to life and then, your, and then your afterlife that was important. So people really were only living to get to the afterlife for centuries and centuries in a Catholic dominant uh, framework within Europe. But as the, in, as the Renaissance hits, people start to question the position of humans in this grand social chain. And they start to come to the idea that, you know, existence is kind of an amazing thing. And, um, and life is kind of an amazing and precious thing. And how amazing and precious is it that humans have this unusual ability to to conceptualize of life and value life and experience in the way that we're able to so philosophy surrounding humans starts to say um, you know if God created everything and God created humans and God is perfect and he created humans in his image then humans must be the most perfect uh, creation of God not to say that all people are perfect 
but that, but that on the social order of things, and again, this makes sense from the European mindset set of having a known social order to everything, this is where the humanists really come out, is they say, look, humans are this amazing creation of God. And, and, and remember that humanism at that time is a, is a devoutly religious movement. It's not, not truly a secular movement because they're not saying that God isn't important or that faith isn't important or that Christianity isn't important at that time. Far from it. In fact, it's exactly Christianity that they're using to substantiate their, their worldview, which is to say that humans should be valued, humans should be looked at, individual identities do matter, for the very purpose that God created humans in his perfect image. So if there's anything that's worth studying pertaining to God's creation, it's probably human achievement. And that's where we get some of that individualism and where we get some of that secularism. Because naturally, the more that you start looking at earthly phenomena, phenomena and you start looking at um, earthly contributions and what individuals are doing, the less you are attributing to divine intervention, right? So if we're looking at human achievement and human beings uh, and, 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 and human worth, we are looking at it only kind of through the lens of humans as a creation of God, but nonetheless, we are still looking at earthly humans and their achievements and, and that's why Petrarch and Mirandola, uh, who, who were some of these, Pico della Mirandola and, and Petrarch, who were some of these early humanist thinkers, elevated the, the potential of humans to being uh, on the course with, with above angels and other things in the realm of the heavens. He says that the human capacity, um, humans have the ability because they are created in God's image to, to reach these unprecedented levels of achievement and um, so when you look at the the humanist writers they really put it, it's it's an over it's in many cases an overly idealized weight on on the ability and achievements of humans being these amazing creatures that are that are perfect essentially or have the capacity for perfection and 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 remember that some of them even said I believe it was in, in um, Mirandola's oration on the dignity of man, where he said that, you know, a man's dignity is only determined by whether he chooses to live in the realm with the angels in the heavens, or if he chooses to lower himself to a level of, say, animals or plants or whatever. Also during this time, Dante's Inferno, uh, or the Divine Comedy, as it's sometimes called, the Inferno is just one part of the Divine Comedy, but in Dante's Inferno, he talks about how humans and sin work, and, um, and humans who engage in sin, sin comes in different levels according to Dante's hierarchy of, of hell, where there are different layers of hell or levels of hell, where there are lesser or greater, more mortal sins, like pride is a really bad one, wrath is a bad one, um, and then you have lesser ones like gluttony and things because of, um, again, comparing sin on an order of being, like you could have, you could have a cat Okay, we won't need to name names here, but you could have a cat that's morbidly obese and he's overly gluttonous and so, but a cat isn't a human, right? And so envy and pride and other things like that, those were distinctly human sins and in Dante's view that made them deadlier. Um, let's see, what else do I need to mention about uh, any of this stuff? Oh, secularism. So when we're talking about secularism, what we're really talking about is the beginning of conceptualizing humans and their earthly achievements. Okay, but I, I, I am always very hesitant to use the word, the word secular because secular leads people to think non-religious, right? To be honest with you, the Italian society is still super, super religious at this time. So when I say secularism, I'm simply talking about studying human earthly achievements uh, as, a, as, as a product of, um, of God's creation of humans, okay? People still are intensely, intensely religious at this time and, um, and devoutly Catholic. Now, the Catholic Church has some things going on that are causing it to have some questionable reputability. Uh, there are, there's a lot of corruption at the upper echelons of the, of the Roman Catholic Church at this time which is going to cause people like Martin Luther and Northern Renaissance thinkers 
to uh, to question the church and and some of its practices, and that's where we end up getting to, uh, you know, Lutheranism and then down the line Calvinism and other things like that. Okay, let me switch back over here to the to the desktop and we'll go back over to here. Okay, uh, Northern Renaissance. How was it? Well, remember, it's more religious. It's also a little bit more socially diverse. Okay, but it is more centered on religion, and it's also more literary than it is artistic. So we do see some art, and we've looked at some of these before. Painter of Peasants, you might remember that, uh, that peasant scene that uh, was by Peter Bruegel the Elder, um, and that was a famous, he's a famous Dutch artist, and then you have um, and then you have Albrecht Durer, who was a German uh, painter uh, with his self-portrait, and then Jan Van Eyck with that famous one with the, uh, the family that's standing, it's like a guy with his hand up, and then a girl who's pregnant, and they're standing, and there's a mirror in the background and stuff like that. Jan Van Eyck, you might remember it. It's got like, uh, the guy's wearing like a green, or the lady's wearing like a green dress. You would recognize it if you saw it, the Arnolfini portrait. Humanism uh, was the intellectual movement of the Renaissance. I kind of talked about this already. Father of humanism was Petrarch. It's an elitist movement, okay? But what's the significance of it? Well, we're starting to see education spread to the lay population for the first time. It's the growth of humanist schools, like the Platonic School in, um, in Florence, the Florentine Platonic Academy, uh, which was founded by Cosimo de' Medici. Um, the printing press, the Gutenberg printing press, is another major aspect of this unit. It led to an increased demand for printing, printed material, both secular and religious printed material. Keep in mind that at this time, a whole lot of people are illiterate. They cannot read. Pretty much the only way you would have been literate is if you were a wealthy, well-to-do uh, noble or merchant uh, of Italy or some other area of this time. And if you did read, chances are the only thing that you were able to read was Latin because that was the only thing that things were printed in until we see the printing press with movable type by Johannes Gutenberg. And when the Gutenberg printing press starts to spread around Europe, it's only then do we see materials that are started to be printed in local vernaculars that people actually speak and use with one another on a daily basis. Because by this point, Latin is a dead language of about a thousand years. And no one really speaks Latin in their everyday lives. It's purely used for, for um, writing and religious purposes. And remember that all masses and stuff like that were conducted in Latin as well. Uh, the, there's created a more educated population in, at least in urban upper echelons of society that started to question the status quo. In other words, uh, what, you know, the status quo is just, the, is tradition, right? That's all it means, really. And they start to challenge traditional authorities and thirst for new ideas. And Christian humanism was the idea that they use, uh, that humans main goal is to better society through religious reforms. And um, so some of these northern humanists, Christian humanists, like, for example, Thomas More, who wrote Utopia, which is an early, early work on how to create a more perfect society through religious reforms, as well as Erasmus. And remember that Erasmus of Rotterdam was the guy who they often said laid the egg that Luther hatched with his In Praise of Folly, which is a piece that we read in class um, about where Erasmus was like the ultimate um, Reddit troll and he just goes on a, a giant rant of all the things that he hates about society and the, the foolishness remember that word folly means in praise of foolishness and he talks about all the foolish behaviors that he felt that people were um, exhibiting at that time that seemed to stray from the principles of the bible then you've got these new monarchs I talked about before, England, France, Spain per particularly. You've got the Beloy dynasty in France, you've got the Tudor dynasty in England, and then you have a new dynasty of, uh, of Catherine of Aragon and Ferdinand of Castile in, uh, in Spain there. And eventually, of course, the Spanish uh, throne gets taken over by the Habsburgs uh, after Charles V, who is the Holy Roman Emperor during the times of Martin Luther. Um, Spain had the strongest army in Europe at that time. They also had a relatively uh, uh, powerful uh, navy which uh, and economy. Remember, Spain at this time also controls the low countries of, of um, Netherlands, Luxembourg, and Belgium. 
and it's not going to be until the late 1500s that we start to see Netherlands break away from Spain to establish, uh, or the mid 1500s, and, and uh, break away from Spain to establish a Protestant independent Dutch Republic. Okay, um, and Spanish uh, Inquisition. You do see church criticisms at this time, okay, where people are uh, questioning the, the church. There's a lot of problems with clerical privileges. We've talked about pluralism, where people were holding more than one office. Absenteeism is another big part of that, where people would hold office and be paid for it, but not even show up holding multiple offices at once, taking multiple salaries, and then clerical privileges, abusing those privileges in particular. And, um, you know, the popes were engaged in all sorts of really uh, what we would probably qualify as sinful behavior, right, between um, sex scandals and um, murders for hire and all sorts of crazy stuff was going on at this time. And the people have virtually no idea that this is going on. Remember that prior to this, there had been a schism in the church that largely went unnoticed by the lay population. Why would they have wanted to let anyone know about it? Um, so a lot of folks are looking at the Catholic Church and kind of it's, it had become very lackadaisical in uh, its interpretation of the Bible. Remember that the Catholic Church uh, priests were oftentimes in, in pa pastors and popes and, and cardinals and whoever else, whoever was in the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church had gotten very loose in its interpretation of the Bible. And so you could take a passage of the Bible and perhaps really t twist the meaning of it around quite a bit from the actual words written on the page to fit a particular situation. And it's, it's, this, um, it's this loose interpretation of the Bible that um, causes guys like Martin Luther to really look into practices like that were seemingly extremely corrupt, like the sale of indulgences. Another big um, part of what defines the understanding of this uh, period of time, guys, that I can't underestimate and pertains to modern day times as well is the, um, is the Black Plague, right? Now, the Black Plague had already hit uh, Europe going back to about the mid 1300s. So it's really the Black Plague isn't something that you'll be asked about on the AP exam, but it's it's nonetheless good to know a little bit about the, the Black Plague because it results in the death of about a third of the population of Europe, which at that time was a considerable number of people. And um, this is going to have a vast, vast, um, uh, this is going to have a vast effect on the European economy because um, when you see a whole bunch of the people who are wealthy, they would go and stay in their country homes and stuff like that away from urban areas. And chances are the wealthier populations are not going to be hit as hard as the poorer populations, which l live, um, you know, in in relative squalor in urban areas and stuff like that. And so the thing that's um, that's important to remember about this is that there's going to be kind of a huge price revolution. Hey, will you guys stop fighting and being knuckleheads? They're playing with it with each other, and they sometimes get a little bit rough and bite each other and stuff like that. They act like, boy, let me tell you, these cats have been something else. I'm about fit to be tied over here after dealing with these guys for the last three weeks. But anyway, so um, I'm so happy to be doing this. This is so much better than just sitting and, and watching the cats do their usual routine. These days I, I tell time by where the cats are laying in the house. Oh, it's 3 p.m. because Harrison's on the couch. You know, I know where all of their, uh, I know where all of their sleeping spots are nowadays. They, they have their little routines. It's actually rather entertaining. You can tell that my life has been really exciting lately. Anyway, uh, point being that, uh, <laughs> point being, I forget what I was saying. Oh, about the Black Plague. That there's a huge economic fallout. The, the, the harder hit populations are going to be people living in urban areas in Italy and stuff like that in those places like Florence and Rome and so on. And, um, and so kind of like with the modern day COVID situation, the virus is going to be able to spread much more quickly where populations are dense. And um, you, we were starting to see urban populations be very dense because they were medieval cities, right? They're walled in. So they're literally walled in. They live really close with one another. And so anyway, they're, they're walled in with one another and um, the Black Plague spreads rather quickly and kills a whole bunch of people. But this is going to have an economic effect because the people that it kills disproportionately are going to be poorer folks. So your laborers and things like that. So if you have a skilled laborer who dies during the plague, 
Now all of a sudden you got a shortage of whatever that laborer used to make, whether they were a, whatever a brick maker or a shoemaker or a silversmith or whatever it is. Now all of a sudden you've got a premium on those services because there's only going to be so many people in a particular area who are able to provide those kinds of services and do that kind of labor. Um, so, so actually, um, the the Black Death because it disproportionately affects kind of these poorer populations. Um, and really everybody's pretty poor at this time with the exception of a very few people but money isn't something that people really accumulated at this time they just basically lived off the land remember it's not a consumer style economy at this time people just produce what they need and it's very rare that you would be able to go out and actually purchase things that you would need for yourself so um, because they're living in a more production-based economy if you wanted to go in and if you were a wealthy person, if you're a merchant and the best cobbler in your neighborhood died, well, now all of a sudden you're going to be paying a premium for for shoes and stuff like that. And um, and and so it kind of puts an emphasis, actually, it, it creates a, a specialized niche for some of these services, services during, during the, the Black, Black Plague, Plague because, because it's like, like people, people need these things and, and so, so many people, people have died that they actually can get a little bit more money for their work now because their services are in high demand because fewer people are doing them because people died from the plague. And so um, that it's kind of interesting that it has a rebound effect on actually because so many people die from, uh, these, from these merchant trade industries in these urban areas, it actually puts an emphasis on their work in future generations, but also causes long-term economic um, fluctuation and stuff uh, in Europe and, and really the Renaissance is them trying to kind of bounce back out of the dark times from the plague. Now the plague is going to stick around for quite a few years and it'll come and go. Um, we really see plagues stick around Europe all the way up till about 1700 or so. Um, after 1700 we don't see Black Plague break out as much anymore. It's more um, it's going to be other things like um, typhoid or um, uh, what's the other one where you get dysentery. Um, dysentery is another big one from like, um, it, it's from like drinking poopy water basically is what it comes from. Uh, and due to the, uh, due to the economic or the um, industrial revolution happening in the 1800s, we see urban areas expand hugely during that time and they get really gross and um, there's not like sanitation and clean water for people to drink and stuff like that. So uh, that's another that's another aspect of it. Okay, moving back to the Renaissance here a little bit, a couple last things. Um, you should probably know some examples of art just in your back pocket. Um, remember that a lot of it celebrates the worth of the individual and depicts the artistic subject in a way that's more perfect than they ever could be in real life. Take, for example, David, Mona Lisa, Vitruvian Man, School of Athens. The fact that St. Peter's Basilica has such uh, a heavy ancient Roman, uh, Greco-Roman influence with its pillars and triangular pediment. It almost looks like a neoclassical building, even though it's a Renaissance building, because of the heavy influence of the ancient uh, antiquity in its design. Uh, the primary goal of art, uh, I, I hate using this word realistic because it's not really realistic portrayal. It's idealistic portrayal of their subjects. Okay, the, I, I really don't, just don't ever describe Renaissance art as realistic. It might mo look more lifelike than art that came before in the Middle Ages, but it's not really that they're trying to portray people realistically, because if we portray people realistically, that means that they're gonna have blemishes and wrinkles and gray hair and other things like that. If you portray people idealistically, they're gonna have perfectly smooth skin. They're gonna have perfectly proportionate features. If you take and divide my face up half and half, okay, um, if you take and divide my face up half and half, my face is not symmetrical, right? It's gonna look different. One half of my face is slightly uglier than the other, okay? And and so, you know, like, that, that's not idealism, but in an ideal painting, you would have somebody who's portrayed perfectly proportionally. They're usually going to have like lots of, you know, tone and definition in their muscles. Okay. Um, beauty standards were different back in those times. 
And so women tended to be a little bit thicker and curvier in art in those days, um, which was seen as more beautiful, more appropriate. Uh, because a girl who was too thin in those days would have been seen as perhaps not being able to bear children or something like that. And, and, and beauty was often um, associated with fertility in those days. And so the more fertile that you looked, the more beautiful that you were considered. Um, also, weight in some sense. Uh, I'm not talking about obesity, but weight was a good thing because if you had some weight on you, it probably meant you had enough money to eat. So it was also about a wealth thing. So, um, so there are there are aspects of beauty that that have changed over time. So anyway, um, but they portray them um, as perfectly as they can, not as realistically as they can. Guys, will you knock it off? You're being so naughty. Stop it. Hey, hey, I'm talking to you, buddy. Get going. Sorry. I'm sitting here fighting and hissing and acting like troublemakers. And I can see Mochi. He doesn't know I can see him, but I can see him in the background there. Get going. Hey, hey, I'm watching you. I'm watching you. I feel like Robert De Niro. I'm watching you over there. I'm watching you, right? So anyway, <clears throat> kids, um, let's move on to different things. Um, oh, I'm sorry, cholera. Did I say I was? I said the wrong thing. It is cholera, um, not dysentery. Dysentery is uh, vitamin C de deficiency. Yes, it's cholera. My mistake. Thank you, Alex. All right. Um, let's see, let's go over here to scene two. All right, so, um, Renaissance Reformation, what else do we got here? New Monarchs, we talked about that. All right, we're going to talk about the Reformation in a different unit. Right now, I'm going to switch over to something else. And I wanted to go over this with you guys. This is the actual, um, let me zoom in a little bit so you can see this a little bit better. This is the actual AP College Board um, guidelines and I included a link for you on Schoology for this so you can take a look at it on your own as well if you wanna look at it a little bit more carefully. But what they do here is they take the Renaissance and Exploration units, which is our unit one and unit three. This was our unit three. They just all have it grouped under unit one here. but. Um, they take kind of the big ideas that they want you to know and they divide it up for you here. So let's take a minute and just page through this so that you have an idea of some of the things that they may potentially be asking you about on this DBQ. So let's contextualize the Renaissance and discovery a bit, okay? Um, you're gonna be analyzing a few different things here. Uh, first of all, some of the pre preview unit one key concepts the rediscovery of works from ancient Greece and Rome and observation of the natural world changed many Europeans view of their world during this time we see a revival of classical texts which led to new methods of scholarship remember that previously the um, the type of scholarship was scholasticism which was mostly rhetorical arguments surrounding the Bible and it was only done by pretty much clerical type people who Education was often very much linked with the church back in those days and new values in both society and religion. It gets replaced by a new humanistic style of learning where we see philosophy of math, philosophy of science, philosophy of philosophy and so on um, studied at universities, which again, remember, are very much tied to churches at this time. The visual arts incorporated new ideas of the Renaissance, like humanism, like individualism, like secularism, and were used to promote personal, political, and religious goals. Europeans explored and settled overseas territories at this time, starting in 1492 with Columbus and then only increasing thereafter, encountering and interacting with indigenous populations over in other areas as well. And you, of course, have European nations being driven very heavily by commercial and religious motives to explore these areas. Remember the three Gs, God, glory, and gold. A couple more here. European society and the experiences of everyday life were increasingly shaped by commercial and agricultural capitalism, but notwithstanding the continued existence of medieval social and economic structures, 
throughout many rural areas across Europe at this time. Remember that the Renaissance kind of is like a stone being thrown into the pond of Europe, and it's going to take a while for the rings of that stone's throw in the ripples in the water to reach areas that are farther away from Italy. Um, so we do start to see some new economic patterns at this time because one of the first things that they start to do when they go over to the New World in the uh, 16th century, in the 1500s, is to set up, for example, the Spanish set up like the encomienda system to try to extract labor from the um, population. We'll talk more about that another day. Uh, thematic focus, the creation and transmission of knowledge, including the relationship between traditional sources of authority. Okay, I'm going to skip over that. That's not important. Let's read about this. Historical developments. Explain how the revival of classical texts contributed to the development of, Ren of the Renaissance in Italy. Well, Italian Renaissance humanists, including Petrarch, who we talked about earlier today, promoted a revival in classical literature and created new philosophical and philological approaches to ancient texts. Some Renaissance humanists furthered the values of secularism and individualism. And then, uh, and that could include guys like Pico della Mirandola and, and so on and so forth. There's a name, there's a list of names over here on this side of people that you may want to know. Lorenzo Valla, Marsilio Ficino, Pico della Mirandola, Niccolo Machiavelli, Baldessari Castiglioni. Some of these names are going to sound familiar to him. You don't need to know all of them necessarily, but you may want to have a few in your back pocket to pull out. Castiglione is a good one. Machiavelli is a good one. Mirandola is a good one. Val is a good one. Petrarch's a good one. Um, and then, of course, you have a bunch of different texts that are uh, and, and artists who are, um, are literary figures and sculptors and artists who are very important as well. So it says promoting it says individuals promoting a revival. That would be Leonardo Bruni. Uh, Alberti and then Machiavelli and then you got painters down here Michelangelo, Donatello, Raphael um, I personally well Filippo Brunelleschi he's the guy who did the dome of the Florence uh, Cathedral okay uh, Santa Maria uh, Cathedral in in Florence Brunelleschi was the guy who um, who uh, constructed that or designed it uh, humanist revival of Greek and Roman texts spread by the printing press challenged the institutional power of universities and the Catholic Church at that time, and it starts to shift the education away from a primary focus on the theological writings towards classical texts and new methods of scientific inquiry. And then you have an admiration for Greek and Roman political institutions, which also supported a revival of like civic humanist culture in Italian city-states, produced secular models for individual and political behavior and things. Now, in the Italian Renaissance, rulers and popes were concerned with enhancing their prestige. And the way that they did this was by patronizing the arts, commissioning paintings and architectural works based on classical styles of ancient Greece and ancient Rome. The developing naturalism in the artistic world and often the newly invented technique of the geometric perspective as well. So remember that some of the new techniques that they're using in art at this time could include um, linear perspective to create more proportional figures within the art as well as depth. Um, they want to portray things as, um, as geometrically accurate as they can. Um, it's also where we see things like color being used and, and shadowing being used in a new way. There's a, uh, there's a new technique called chiaroscuro, which was this light dark technique that, um, that allowed for a uh, much more accurate portrayal of depth and um, you know, field of vision within the painting. Um, and then like, uh, you know, a lot of classical figures were included in the arc. So if you think about like the School of Athens, for example, includes guys like, you know, Plato and Aristotle in the main uh, center fit part of the thing. But you also had in there somewhere Socrates and Pythagoras and other people like that who were considered important ancient Greco-Roman figures. Uh, who were portrayed right into the art. Remember, too, in School of Athens, uh, as a, as a um, piece of evidence about individualism, uh, one of the things that you conclude is the fact that he painted himself into the portrait with all of these other greats, um, acknowledging the fact that he himself was aware that he was a master of his time. Um, and then you have other examples of that with Michelangelo's work as well, with the Sistine Chapel and things. Okay, so moving forward here, let's talk a little bit about the Northern Renaissance. 
Remember the Northern Renaissance retained a more religious focus, which resulted in more human-centered naturalism, considered individuals in everyday life appropriate objects of artistic representation, and uh, it was embodied in the writings of Erasmus, amongst others, uh, Thomas More. The invention of the printing press, we talked about that already, so I'm going to skip past that. Monarchs and princes, uh, Henry VII, Henry VIII, Elizabeth I, all of them are going to be of the Tudor dynasty. These new monarchies laid the foundation for centralizing the modern state by establishing things like monopolies on tax collection, um, employing military force, dispensing justice in a more even-handed way rather than local justice administered by local lords. Um, one of the ways that the jury trial emerged in England is through some of these um, centralizing powers and then gaining the right to determine the religion of their subjects as well as another major aspect of new monarchies because these monarchies dictated the religion that was to be practiced by their subjects. So in England, for example, Henry, breaks, Henry VIII breaks away from the Catholic Church, creates the Church of England, also known as the Anglican Church. And he makes that the legal uh, 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 religion of the land and also makes himself the head of the church, almost as though the king and the, um, and the pope are unified in the same figure. Um, but not the pope, but the, you know, the leader of the Church of England. Across Europe, uh, commercial and professional groups retained more power or gained more power and played a greater role in political affairs. And you see continued political fragmentation in Italy as well as in the Holy Roman Empire. Technological advances in the age of exploration, I'm gonna save because we'll get back to that when we talk about reviewing that. Rivals on the world stage, we're gonna save. Colombian exchange, we're gonna save. Uh, slave trade, we're gonna save. Commercial revolution, we're gonna save. Uh, is there anything else I need to talk about with respect to the Renaissance, in particular the Renaissance? Uh, economic patterns, no. Ca oh, causation in the Renaissance and Age of Discovery. Okay, so explain the causes and consequences of the Renaissance and Age of Discovery. Let's talk, I have a whole slide. You may wanna go on the PowerPoint, by the way. I don't know if you guys know this, but on Schoology, let me, in fact, let me show you this here. You can go on Schoology to, let's say you go to your period that you're in, you click on files and links, I have still kept for you all the PowerPoints are right here in this gray folder that says previous PowerPoints. You can literally pull up all the PowerPoints that we have used in class all the way up through imperialism uh, right here on Schoology. And I strongly suggest that you take a look at some of these because if you pull up the Renaissance PowerPoint, you're gonna find some really good slides in there that you could use to review things like what we're looking at right now, which is causes and consequences of the Renaissance and Age of Discovery. Uh, we still have 26 people in here. How are you guys doing? Any, um, any questions or anything? Doesn't look like it. Looks like you guys are doing all right. So um, just to, to kind of move forward here, um, talking about causes and consequences. Well, the rediscovery of works from ancient Greece and Rome and the observation of the natural world through looking at the stars in particular changed many Europeans' view of their world at this time. You have a revival of classical texts, which led to new methods of scholarship, new values in both uh, society and religion. The visual arts incorporated the new ideas of the Renaissance were used to promote political, personal, and religious goals. Uh, and Europeans go over and start selling. We have new things that get invented during this time as well, thanks to the Portuguese and their navigational um, technologies. So we start to see things like the Latin sail and um, you know, car, uh, caravels, uh, caravel built whole, uh, um, hulls of ships, H-U-L-L, -L, the hull of a ship, not a hole, a hull in a ship. And, um, these, these new hulls made the, um, ship more seaworthy so that it could be taken out on the ocean. Remember that the Portuguese, well, we'll get to that. I, I won't spoil the, the show on that one. We'll talk about that on a different day. Um, European society and the experiences of everyday life were, were increasingly shaped by commercial and agricultural capitalism. We talked about that, and that brings us all the way through there. Now, let's talk about a couple of things here, and, and here's what your assignment is going to be for, uh, for today to get your extra credit points. So um, I have included a link for you on Schoology if you go into the uh, folder on Schoology, and I'll show you what this looks like here. So let me move this over. You go to Schoology. You're going to go to Courses. You click on your course, let's say you're in period zero, 
you click on um, this new pink folder here that says new distance learning lessons and you see this one that we were doing today right here lesson two here's the link for the live lecture the thing that you're watching right now so since you've already watched it um, you probably won't have to watch it again but it is there if you want to and then what I've included for you is those curriculum standards that I just that I just had up here this I showed you how to get this earlier and then um, these are the practice questions so this link here if you click on this you're gonna have to click a second time up here on this link again because it never opens it up the first time so you click got to click again at the top right here and then it's gonna finally open it up for you and it's gonna look like this it may ask you to sign in you may have to sign just to let you know I'm already signed in but it may ask you to sign into AP classroom or AP up oh, see it's asking me right now to do my password here okay so I got to verify did it work Uh oh nope it did not work might have to type it in here Did I type that right? Whenever I'm streaming, uh, my computer goes really slowly. Hang on one second. So it's going to ask you to sign in, and it's going to look something like th not this. <laughs> it's going to look something like. Let me click this again. Try this. Maybe it's not going to let me do it. Wait, now it's logging me in. Did it work? Okay, it worked. So this is what it should look like. Okay, well, actually, let me click student view and you'll see what it looks like. So you're, it, it's going to look like this for you. Okay, this is how it's going to look for you. And your assignment, okay, your assignment is going to be down here. And you should have already registered for the exam. Uh, you're going to click full assignment list, I think. Hmm. See, it doesn't let me, in student view, it doesn't let me do this. Let's do this here. Let's go to period zero well one second let's do student view I just want to see something here you're gonna to have to find a way I don't know how to do it for students what I know is you got to do there's gonna be a thing that says assignments here okay ignore what these start and due dates are okay just ignore those but what you can do is you should be able to click full assignment list and what you're gonna look for is these questions right here called one second I can't really give you a direct link to it uh, evidently I can't do that from here one second I had it up just a minute ago but now I'm now I lost it let's try this Hmm. You're going to have to find a way to get in. There is a way of doing this. There's got to be an easier way. Um, there has got to be an easier way for this. So my AP College Board. Back to AP Classroom. I'm trying to get you guys to the multiple choice unit one questions. So AP European History. It should look like this. This is the page that I'm trying to get to, okay? This is what it should look, period zero. 22 of you have yet to start on it. But this is the thing that you have to do here. Unit one, I wonder if I can, see it says the sign up here, but I think I already assigned it all. So assign. Okay, so yeah, it says it's already assigned or in progress. So you can just do this. It, you should have it in your list somewhere um, on there. Let me go back and see if you guys have been saying anything. Unit one progress check. 
MCQ. Yes, that is it. That is it. So you're going to do that. Okay. And now I'm typing to you, but so you're going to do that. And when you finish it, okay, it should give you a score. Okay. And I will be able to see that score, but we're going to, I'm going to have you do one last step. Okay. And the one last step is that you're going to take a screenshot of your of the fact that you completed it i want you to take a screenshot and there's multiple ways that you can do that but hopefully most of you know how to take a screenshot if you don't look up how do i take a screenshot on if you're using windows put windows if you're using a mac put mac and figure it out um, but in, on windows you can use like snipping tool for example you just type it into the little search bar and it'll pop right up and you can just snip whichever thing you want save it as a picture and then upload that picture and then what you're going to do is you're going to say you're going to upload that picture. I'm going to do this right now. So we're going to put this here, add new materials, add assignment, because this will make it easier for me to grade it. So I'm going to have you do this this way. Um, so I don't have to be jumping between 6 million windows. So I'm going to have you guys submit, uh, your submit. What, it, what is it called again? Let's take a look. I want to get the wording exactly right. Unit one progress check MCQ. Okay. Um, AP central college board MCQ. Okay. T so instructions go to AP central, uh, log in, go to assignment list in AP Classroom and find uh, Unit 1 Progress Check MCQ, complete all questions. Then when you are done, take a screenshot of the final score you got and upload that screenshot on to here as your assignment and that will allow me to see very easily who did and who did not do it now this is going to be due on uh, friday at 8 a.m which is going to be our next um, time that we get together in here and so friday at 8 a.m will be the next lecture today i had to start a little bit late but I hope that that makes sense to you guys. And then I have to copy this over to, before I forget, I have to copy this over to the other two classes. Okay, we'll do that and we'll do this. All right, now um, I will be updating grades, but um, you know, be patient with me about that. It won't take me too long to do. I just have to sit down and, and get it done. Um, but I'm gonna wait until there's a couple assignments so I can get it all done at once. So I'll probably wait until this weekend or so to, uh, to get some of that stuff taken care of. Um, if you have extra stuff that you wanna study, this is gonna conclude it for me for my review of the Renaissance, but um, I really do recommend that you take some time between now and Friday to use this time to study more stuff pertaining to the Renaissance since we're on it. Use this time to go back, look over your reading guides if you still have them from the first unit. Um, uh, the reading guides are, are still available. Old reading guide questions are still up uh, even if you don't have the completed ones anymore. Um, I would recommend also paging through your textbook all right to uh to remind yourself of some of the things that you read about back in the start of the school year um, watch videos on youtube if you want to learn a little bit more about christian humanism or if you want to learn a little bit more about thomas More's utopia or or whatever it is take some time to do that um, watch some videos it won't take you long and you might learn a thing or two that maybe i didn't have a chance to mention today in our little review session so i hope that you found this uh, helpful for you guys today that's going to conclude our lesson uh, for Wednesday, April 8th, and I will see you guys back here on Friday, April 10th at 8 a.m. 
for our review on the Reformation. So that'll be the next thing that we take a look at. And yeah, look forward to seeing you then, guys. Take care.